So welcome to this presentation title Human Behavior in Fire Emergencies, what do we know? And uh, my name is Eric Koronke and I'm Associate Professor of the Department of Fire Safety Engineering at Lund University in Sweden and I'm very happy uh, to give a talk at the 13th International Congress of Fire Safety and Science arranged by IFV. Uh, so uh, in this presentation uh, we're going to have uh, give a, I'm going to give an overview of the main uh, theories that we can use uh, to understand human behavior in fire uh, starting to some uh, very widely spread concepts related to the panic and the misconception of panic which is probably one of the main keywords that will appear uh, when we think about human behavior in an emergency and how this uh, panic concept can be linked to uh, human behavior in fire. And uh, this will be explained also uh, together uh, with a theory that is uh, widely used to uh, indeed um, make people understand uh, uh, the misconception that may be linked to the definition of panic. And that's called the social identity theory. So I'm going to explain a bit what this theory says. Afterwards, I will give an overview of uh, decision making in fire evacuation, making some examples of, of theories that can be used uh, to uh, indeed predict to a certain extent human behavior or interpret a set of behaviors that may be uh, observed during uh, an emergency. And then down the line, uh, we will slowly transition uh, from more like uh, theoretical aspects of human behavior in fire to more practical implications of those. So we will see what are behavioral statements intended here as a set of statements that can be used uh, to um, uh, to understand what are expected behavior during a fire evacuation emergency for instance and uh, going uh, from theory uh, to practice like seeing indeed how then we can um, uh, indeed represent the decision making process uh, uh, during uh, a fire emergency. Conclusions will then go uh, and present an overview indeed of uh, the main findings related to the theories that uh, we will review and uh, see in this presentation. So when we talk about human behavior in fire, uh, it is of course a quite a wide uh, uh, topic uh, in terms of the fact that it might um, take into consideration uh, different aspects and different uh, fields of science. So. Um, Coming from a department of fire safety engineering, I start with an engineering approach on this, but uh, it's quietly, quite obvious that this is very linked to uh, the field of psychology because we are looking at human behavior. But not only because then uh, there are several other fields that play a role in human behavior in fire. So, for instance, the field of applied maths or applied physics are quite important uh, because many of the models uh, that then uh, are available. Uh, to facilitate uh, fire evacuation design are actually then um, mathematical models or applied physics models which uh, try to implement different theories and behavior into usable tools. Or in the same way, uh, when we talk about human behavior in fire, we often talk about movement and uh, people movement, crowd movement and so on. So either in isolation or in a crowd. And there might be aspects linked to biomechanics that might be interested in how a crowd moves, uh, especially when we look more into uh, crowds and how the crowd dynamics interact in the space. But again, these are just examples. There are many more actually that may play a role uh, on the human behavior of fire uh, field. So the first question uh, that we are addressing here is the so-called uh, concept of panic. So can we say that people behave rationally or do they panic uh, uh, in case of a fire emergency? And I mean, uh, it's very commonly uh, seen uh, in the uh, media or in movies that uh, we actually um, can identify the word panic as one of the first words that will actually pop up uh, when uh, we actually refer to a fire, you have a fire uh, emergency. And here I just put a couple of screenshots uh, from different newspapers all around the world or movies and so on in which the word uh, panic or a different variation of the word in different languages uh, appear. Uh, but uh, is this concept, the way this 
represented in media and the way the behaviors that are represented in media are they actually linked to what we will actually observe uh, in the real world so that's a bit the question uh, that we are trying to answer in here to begin with so to do to, to answer to this question we should start looking into the scientific literature and we can see in the scientific literature that sometimes uh, the word panic appear even there and uh, uh, there was a quite interesting uh, recent study of uh, two years ago uh, from Agani et al. that looked at the, a couple of uh, keywords very much used in the field of crowd dynamics but also in uh, your behavior in emergencies and they saw how they were used and who used those and uh, not surprisingly uh, the concept of panic appeared uh, but the majority of panic quotes were actually coming from studies in the domain of physical sciences. So mostly modeling uh, studies that treat the existence of panic as a proven fact. So basically they were taken from granted that they were, like say, supporting uh, the word and the terminology of panic when explaining and talking about human behavior and fire. On the other hand, the situation was completely the opposite when looking at the quotes extracted from studies published by social scientists, who are actually the ones that are supposed to know more about what is happening in an emergency. And the majority of the studies said they challenge the, the, the concept of panic and how it's used nowadays, uh, which was quite interesting because it makes them understand that sometimes even who develops uh, uh, models might not have um, uh, a complete understanding of what is the scientific literature that comes from the field of psychology. So uh, this uh, is a very important uh, study that make us ring the bell on how and when we can use the word panic and when instead we cannot really use it. In reality, uh, the word panic and the panic terminologies is heavily criticized in the field of human behavior and fire, in particular uh, by uh, psychologists and also uh, by a set of engineers that have translated the concepts, uh, many of the concepts and theories defined in psychology uh, in the fire safety engineering field. And why this is criticized? For different reasons. First of all, uh, it's often used as a scapegoat to excuse design faults. Uh, we have seen in uh, one of the screenshots that I put before that, for instance, it was written uh, panic was the cause of X number of uh, deaths in this uh, scenario. So trying to put the blame on people when something occurred. And also, uh, another sharp criticism uh, comes to the fact that media often wants to achieve sensationalism because their goal is not necessarily to report the truth on, in all cases, unfortunately, but it's more to sell newspapers. And we see this more and more uh, now that we have uh, uh, internet and uh, s too much information sometimes available on, uh, on an event, too much irrelevant information. So the problem nowadays is not to find information, but to find relevant information. So uh, this term has been heavily criticized in the literature since the 80s and the uh, psychologists and also engineers that uh, um, make use of these uh, psychological studies uh, have looked more closely at the definition of the formal definition of panic and this seems to refer to concepts like inappropriate, excessive or irrational behavior, acute slash persistent fear reactions, extravagant or injudicious efforts, so people doing something that will not actually help them uh, during an emergency, or competition, so breaking social order, like competing to save themselves. So uh, looking at this uh, uh, formal definition then, uh, several researchers have started trying to match uh, if those definitions and those behaviors can actually be observed in real emergencies. So what was looked at, uh, looking at several cases of fires over the years uh, and also other type of emergencies is that the panic term is often misused because it's used to describe own or other people behavior that are actually not linked to the list of definition of panic that we have seen there. So they are used to uh, refer to behaviors and feelings and emotions like stress, anxiety or fear, but not this competitive or irrational or antisocial behavior that we looked at uh, in the form of definition. Also, there is a quite common mistake that is done is that uh, people, uh, when they look at a fire event afterwards, they assume that people may have complete information and they may assume uh, 
uh, that a wrong decision was the result of purely um, uh, a, an irrational uh, choice made by a person. But in reality, we know that people might not have full information uh, that we have afterwards, after the event happens. Sometimes it even takes years uh, for the uh, people doing investigations to figure out exactly what happened and what information, uh, what is actually the truth in that scenario. So uh, uh, it's actually wrong to assume people have complete information. Uh, and that's why sometimes we may see behaviors that are Apparently, do not look rational, but in reality, may simply be the result of uh, a lack uh, of information. And also, uh, the panic term is often used to assess uh, own ability to respond to responses that do not appear the best for the situation. As I said, it might be uh, that uh, not necessarily people take the best choices during a fire emergency, but this doesn't mean necessarily that it is an irrational decision. It might be a rational decision based on limited information or based on the fact that people do not necessarily take the best uh, decisions uh, in an emergency, even if those are uh, rational. So this concept of panic has been uh, over the years really questioned and uh, let's say it's one of those forbidden words in our um, scientific field uh, for people that actually have studied this subject not uh, of uh, unfortunately there are modelers that build models without having too much understanding of what they're actually modeling not all of them of course but some they do uh, but uh, this concept has been heavily questioned and instead, there are theories that are actually presenting quite solid arguments against the panic uh, misconception and the way this is uh, used to define behaviors as selfish and uncontrolled. And in recent years, social psychologists have developed and tested a concept of model of affiliative collective behavior, so basically uh, people behaving uh, in a group in a collective way and actually uh, displaying um, cooperative behaviors in emergency and disasters. And let's see now how this social identity theory has been used. Uh, the social identity theory tells us that uh, we have uh, uh, different layers of identities and, and this can be linked to our personal identity but also social identity which means that each of us can be uh, identifying themselves for instance, based on their age, based on their gender, based on their race, education, or many other factors that give us a social identity. So uh, this means uh, that uh, all of us have different layers of identities and uh, there are layers that we have in common with others. So for instance, if I'm a supporter of a football team or if I am, uh, uh, let's say, uh, passionate about a particular hobby, this may make me have a shared social identity with somebody else. Uh, and what happened that during an evacuation emergency people share a collective social identity regardless of who they are because they all are by default victims of the fire emergency of the threat so we all have in common in such type of scenario the fact that we are all victims of uh, the fire uh, emergency so this makes us actually having a shared social identity by default and we know from research that uh, shared social identity also means that we are more prone to help people around us uh, rather than to compete with others if we have a shared social identity. There are a couple of very interesting experiments run on this. For instance, one that is very uh, popular in social psychology is one experiment in which people, uh, there were some actors that were actually staying uh, outside of a stadium and they were uh, pretending to feel uh, very ill, to have uh, some sort of a heart condition or some sort of a fainting. And uh, uh, this uh, situation with these actors was repeated first with people having the same football t-shirt of the uh, actual game that was playing in, in, in that stadium. So for instance, if it was like a sport of Manchester, you will have a person, an actor feeling ill with the t-shirt of Manchester. You could see the people will actually stop and try to help the person and, and figure out if that person was feeling okay. Then they repeated the same very experiment with the same actors in this social experiment, but with people having a t-shirt of a opponent team. <laughs> and then they saw that it was much, much less likely for people to stop and try to to help that person, that actor that was pretending to feel uh, ill. So this tells us indeed, and, and there are many different experiments of this kind, that when we have a shared social identity, we are more prone to cooperate and to help other people around us, even if the, all everything else is identical. And this is a very strong argument for actually uh, 
saying that we have a great concern towards others in the crowd. Actually, uh, psychologists that use the social identity theory identify the crowd either as a psychological crowd as an, an aggregate. Uh, so in a psychological crowd is a crowd that has greater concerns towards the others, including strangers. Uh, they tend to help each other and uh, even uh, go for self-sacrifices and coordinate their efforts. And there is a, an expectation of support and a fewer selfish or competitive behavior. While instead, when we have an aggregate of people, imagine like in the figure here, uh, a bunch of people that are just in a metro station, uh, rushing to work or something like this, uh, those, they don't have this greater concern towards the other, so they might not expect coordination and helping behavior. So this makes understand how important it is to figure out what is the likely scenario in an emergency, considering the fact that we all have a shared social identity in that case that comes from the fact that we are all living the same experience, in this case a fire uh, emergency. So all in all, can we say the panic occurs in evacuation? Well, we cannot say that it never happens. Uh, but we can say that in the great majority of cases, uh, people behave uh, more altruistically than competitively. So competitive behaviors have been extremely rarely observed in, in, in actual fire scenarios. And also the panic concept does not really match actual behavior, which in most cases are based on rational decision making. So we cannot actually make an assumption that behaviors of people would be irrational. So maybe making an effort that is in, uh, in judicial or really not really helping to achieve safety. And again, even if we see something that may look like that, it may be due to a, a wrong decision made by people uh, in the fire emergency scenario, but not necessarily an irrational decision. It can be a wrong rational decision, which can come from the fact that people may have assessed uh, wrongly the situation or may have incomplete information about the event. So, in general, human behavior in fire models are based on assumption that people behave rationally. So, we develop and use models to predict rational decision making. So, we make the assumption that uh, we can uh, represent the decision making process with uh, models of rational uh, decisions. And what are those models? Well, there is a long list of uh, models and behavioral theories that can help an understanding how people behave during a fire emergency. But let's look at some uh, uh, classic uh, ones and most common ones that are, can actually be helpful in um, uh, fire evacuation design and uh, understand for understanding you may have fire. The first one is affiliation theory that explains why do people ignore the closest emergency exit and why do people uh, evacuate in groups. Uh, this is um, mostly because people during an emergency do not actually move away from the emergency, but they move towards <laughs> the familiar. So they want to move towards familiar places or familiar people, especially when there is uncertainty uh, about the situation. And this implies that people will tend to move towards uh, people that they have a bond with, so family members, friends, and this is something that is observed very often in fire emergencies, or places. And this explains the common issue that we have that um, uh, in a large shopping mall or in a tunnel, as we can see uh, here, we often observe uh, in fire emergencies behavior that uh, uh, in which people goes and use the way they will use regularly uh, as a circulation uh, path. Uh, inside the building or in the infrastructure rather than using emergency exits that are seen as an unfamiliar and not uh, a commonly used place. And so the efforts that the designer should put is more in making these unfamiliar uh, places look uh, more uh, attractive for people so that they will use it. So rather than having people evacuating a shopping mall through the main entrance using the emergency exit. And the same could be for a tunnel rather than using the tunnel portals but using an emergency exit. So this is very important information because we cannot assume by default that people will just uh, behave according to what we want them to do uh, in our um, evacuation uh, plan. Another important aspect that plays an important role uh, in uh, emergency is social influence. And let's have a look now at the video of an experiment that was conducted in the 70s by Latane and Dali. What they did was uh, to actually invite a person uh, in a room, uh, give them a f bogus task, so a task that was a questionnaire, uh, and then during this task uh, there was smoke coming in the room, they were not aware uh, that this was an experiment, they were thinking it was just a questionnaire, so 
uh, immediately when person saw the smoker was alone in the room it got close to the uh, door where the smoke was coming and then uh, pick up their stuff actually changing their mind do not even pick up the stuff but just leave the room so this was uh, quite immediate uh, reaction and response then the very same experiment was repeated with other people but with so-called confederates so those were actors they were instructed to not do anything when the smoke was coming into the room so the participant of this experiment while was doing uh, the bogus task of filling up this questionnaire started realizing that the smoke was coming through the room but since we we'll look around and see that nobody will do anything will actually not react so we'll still keep looking around looking at the smoke looking at other people but since nobody was reacting in the room she will continue sitting there and you will see in the video that this will last quite long until actually the experiment was uh, terminated so this is a so-called passive by bystander effect so if we see other people who are not acting we tend to conform to the norm so we don't want to stick out from the rest of the crowd and this is something that we can observe a lot in fire evacuation emergencies so people tend to respond earlier when they're alone while they actually respond much slower if they are surrounded by people that are not actually acting uh, for this reason, social influence is often divided into normative social influence, which refers to uh, us conforming to the norm, and informational social influence, right? so using the information of looking around us to get more information about the events. Here you can see that uh, the experiment was actually stopped. And over the years, several other researchers repeated these experiments in different settings. We actually did something uh, like this also at Lund University. We repeated the experiment, but we use also eye tracking. So we wanted to to repeat the experiment with two students were acting as actors and we had participants we we're giving them a computer and tell them okay you need to fill in this questionnaire on this computer we are studying where do you look on the screen with this eye tracking devices and we actually wanted to see um, how people uh, react and where they were looking when you will have the passive bystanders when, when they, will, uh, they will be alone and it was quite interesting to see that actually uh, the behavior observed in Latin and Dali experiments the original one was repeated but also uh, the presence of other people affects the way we look around so we tend much more to try to gather information by looking at other people rather than by looking at the threat that is possibly uh, in our space in the room Another very widely used uh, theory is the role rule model and this uh, is a theory that tells us that we people keep uh, their pre-fire roles during a fire evacuation. So for instance if we have uh, guests and staff, authorities or general public or manager employees, security guard attendees, so people will tend to keep the roles so they will have a, a much more important role during a fire emergency than everybody else. So if you have um, somebody like an authority or staff or manager or somebody has a leading role even without a fire emergency it's very important they behave uh, in the most appropriate way because they have a much more uh, higher power to influence the course uh, of the events another important aspect is that we know that people uh, often react slowly or uh, very late uh, when there is a, a fire emergency and this has been studied systematically in the scientific literature and there are some experiments conducted by Friedhoff and Nielsen in which uh, people were asked to watch some videos of a, a fire um, actually um, uh, starting up and then they were asking people to predict what the fire growth will be and it was quite clear that people systematically underpredicted the fire growth. So uh, humans tend to be much better at predicting linear, uh, uh, linear events, so events that grow in a linear way than exponential events like might be a fire. So this makes people tend to underestimate a lot the severity of a situation. Those we observe often people are reacting late or um, underestimating the threat. So, uh, and if we look uh, uh, at how we can actually predict human behavior, we often have, uh, we want to actually understand how people behave and, and we figure out that it's kind of hard to say, okay, uh, people will react and behave in this exact same way. And there is a very interesting quote from Jason Avery from 2011 that I often use. It was one of the investigators looking at the World Trade Center fire uh, in 9-11. Uh, 
and uh, it was saying that if you evacuate the same building with the same people, even starting the same places on consecutive days, the answers may uh, vary significantly. So how do we deal with this, with the fact that there is still some variation? So do we know some factors that may affect the behavior, but there is still so quite some uh, variation in the behaviors that we may observe. We actually do not know with certainty how people behave, but we know that we can predict a certain range of behavior and we know that there are a certain of expected factors that might influence those behaviors. So your behavior fire knowledge is often boiled down into very simple behavioral statements that can be used to inform our design. And these behavioral statements have been built upon the so-called protective action decision model. That is a model that help us understanding uh, the different phases of uh, uh, decision making during uh, uh, an evacuation emergency. So uh, Kuligoski et al. in 2017, what they did, we're looking at different stages of the protective action decision model, starting from the cues that you get from the environment that can be environmental, social, or information sources, and then starting from risk identification, risk assessment, and protection action search, protection action assessment, and finally the implementation of these protection actions, and see for each stage if it is possible to define a set of statements that approximate likely human behavior in fire. So we know, as uh, based on the theories like the ones that I presented earlier, that it's very likely that people will do this. So example of this statement would be, okay, we know that people uh, tend to satisfy rather than optimize, so we, d we are not going to pick the best, quickest possible route, but we're going to try to pick a route that is good enough for us in order to get to safety. And there are many statements like this. We know that people are, uh, tend to move towards familiar places. We know that are influenced by the action of others and so on. So I really recommend you to have a look into this paper because it gives you quite good guidance to understand what is the expected uh, behavior that people will have in a fire vacation emergencies. And then how this information is used. In fire evacuation design, we often uh, implement then and use these theories uh, uh, to define the course of actions of people into simplified time engineering uh, models. So these are timelines in which actually you have different phases of an evacuation, starting from ignition, and uh, you might have an awareness phase, pre-movement and movement phase, or depending uh, if you look in the behavioral timeline, you can look at detection alarm, recognition, so understanding what is happening, what is going on, and then response, so deciding to act and reach eventually a safe place. So this is what we actually often use uh, to represent human behavior. So simplified timeline engineering models that are uh, implemented at individual or at uh, a collective level. And then, based on these timelines, we uh, there have been several studies trying to quantify uh, certain types of behavior. For instance, the pre-vacation phase, so what people do before they start their purposive movement towards a safe place. So we can actually uh, approximate the times that people take to uh, during that phase uh, based on several conditions like type of population, the type of scenarios, type of alarms and so on. Uh, and this is generally approximated with different type of distribution. So we cannot say with a certainty of a constant number, but we can say, okay, there is a reasonable time span that people take in order to do this set of actions uh, during the pre-vacation phase. And similarly, in the movement phase, we can consider different levels of movement, starting from the strategic level, so where people will go, so what is the route that they will pick to reach the destination that they want to pick, and how this is affected by the factors that we we'll look at before, for instance, theory of affiliation, social influence, and so on. And then also how the local movement works, so how people interact in the crowd. So what is the actual speed that they might have in, cor in correspondence to what is the level of density that they have, so how many people they are surrounded by, and if there is the presence of smoke. This is another impact uh, factor that can have quite of an impact on their uh, behavior. So to conclude, uh, we should move away from the panic misconception and work on explaining rational decision-making processes. So try to understand how the decision-making happens and what are the rational factors that we can use to explain this decision-making process and then down the line use this information to improve our design. So we cannot just expect that people will comply to what we tell them to do. Classic example is uh, strategies, for instance, that rely to defend in place. So if you don't make sure to... Uh, have people that stay and defend uh, in the room if there is a strategy like that but instead they leave then uh, the strategy will likely fail and, uh, and there are many other examples of strategies that really rely 
on uh, an expected behavior, but in order to have this expected behavior, we have to understand what are the factors that might impede this behavior to happen, and then we have to act upon it, so try to ensure that we have taken countermeasures for that. So, uh, we also looked at key human behavior in fire theories, uh, just some examples, I didn't have time to go through all of them, but this can be helpful to predict behavior and explain sequence of events, and we look at the simplified engineering timeline that is used often in fire vacation design, and also I uh, listed some um, um, interesting work done to define behavioral statements. I really recommend you to have a look at that paper because it really gives you an idea of, uh, in a very single compact uh, sentences, what you are expected to see in a fire evacuation, uh, in a fire emergency. So that's it. If you have any questions, I will be here to answer to your questions. And otherwise, you can also uh, send me an email at uh, this email address. Thanks, and here you have some references also. Thanks.